From the historic chapel in Cambridge, England, the world-renowned King's College Choir celebrates Christmas in a program of favorite carols and readings. Join us for Christmas at King's. Christmas at King's is brought to you by Honeywell with best wishes for a happy holiday season and a world of peace in the new year. From the heart of Cambridge, England, come the sights and sounds of a time long ago when life and culture were centered in learning and religion, in architecture and music. Since that time, the sounds of one of the world's most celebrated choirs have echoed throughout King's College Chapel, famous for its resonant acoustics and fan-vaulted ceiling. If you take a human voice and let it float, the building kind of rejoices at it and, and holds it. And you get this famous echo, which the choir knows just how to hit, which seems to make a human voice go right up and not become angels' voices, whatever they may be, but to become, to add a sort of poignancy and a brilliance to it. This characteristic brilliance of the choir is the sound of 16 boys, known as choristers. Wearing traditional Eton collars and top hats, the boys march in formation, called a crocodile, through town, and over the river cam to their daily rehearsal at the chapel. It's great fun, really. Another thing you honor and experience. And people, um, well, like your grandma says, oh, you, my, my grandson's in the choir. It makes me feel happy. The balance of the choir is made up of 14 young men, the choral scholars, and this year, for the first time in the choir's 500-year history, one of them is an American. Coming over as an American in uh, one of the oldest places in England is quite an honor. And I had a few worries about what just the turn, you know, how, how my voice, being an American, would sound in the choir. Uh, that hasn't, in terms of my American accent, that usually isn't a problem, except for uh, I, was, I, I used to get uh, hung up on inheritance which is nice, you know, and, and bless thine inheritance. But you can't say that over here, it's inheritance. The clear and unified blend of men's and boys' voices, for which the choir is renowned, is carefully nurtured by one of the world's foremost conductors of choral music, Stephen Cleberry. Many more things in a rehearsal pass through one's mind than one actually articulates verbally. You're looking, essentially, for a musically correct performance, that's to say with the right notes and in tune at the right time, those sort of basic nuts and bolts things, but you're also looking for things which are more subtle and in some cases quite intangible, which can't always be put into words and are often better expressed by gesture. The hours of diligent rehearsals culminate on Christmas Eve, when one of the boys is selected to sing the solo that traditionally begins the service. To hear the voice of a young boy, a very fresh, very vulnerable voice, and you kind of hold on, you think, is he going to be all right? He's so little. That's something extremely moving, that uh, this conjunction of a very young human being in obviously a very big and very old place 
And that says a lot, I think, and it sort of symbolizes such a lot about Christmas. And now, Christmas at King's. Here at King's, we're used to contributing to what is accustomed and ceremonious at Christmas. But now we want to savour more of its unofficial side. We're a household of individuals, thinking now about other individuals and other households. The readings come from the five centuries since this chapel was begun in 1446. They tell of bustle as well as ceremony, 
of sadness as well as celebration and of anxiety as well as quiet faith. The music responds to the readings. We begin, as we will end, with prayers from our own century, from the Christmas Oratorio, For the Time Being, which W. H. Auden wrote in 1945. Let us pray. Though written by thy children with a smudged and crooked line, the word is ever legible, thy meaning unequivocal, and for thy goodness, even sin is valid as a sign. Inflict thy promises with each occasion of distress, that from our incoherence we may learn to put our trust in thee and brutal fact persuade us to adventure, art, and peace. <laughs> St. Luke tells of the birth of Christ. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. 
And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I sing of the maiden that is makeless, king of all kings, to her son she chose. He came all so still, 
There his mother was, as dew in April that falleth on the grass. He came all so still to his mother's bower, as dew in April that falleth on the flower. He came all so still. There his mother lay, as dew in April that falleth on the spray. Mother and maiden was never none but she. Well may such a lady God's mother be. Yet if his majesty, our sovereign lord, should of his own accord friendly himself invite and say, I'll be your guest tomorrow night, how should we stir ourselves, call and command all hands to work, let no man idle stand. Set me fine Spanish tables in the hall, see they be fitted all, let there be room to eat, and order taken, but thou want no meat. See every sconce and candlestick made bright, that without tapers they may give a light. Look to the present, are the carpet spread, the daisy o'er the head, the cushions in the chairs, and all the candles lighted on the stairs. Perfume the chamber. And in any case, let each man give attendance in his place. Thus, if a king were coming, would we do? And were good reason too? For it is a duteous thing to show all honor to an earthly king. And after all our travail and our course, so he be pleased to think no labor lost. But at the coming of the King of Heaven, all set at six and seven, we wallow in our sin. Christ cannot find a chamber in the inn. We entertain him always like a stranger, and as at first still lodge him in the manger.
this stupendous stranger, Swains of Solima, advise. Lead me to my master's manger. Show me where my saviour lies. O oh, most mighty, O oh, most holy, far beyond the seraph's thought, art thou then so mean and lowly as unheeded prophets taught? O oh, the magnitude of meekness, worth from worth immortal sprung, O oh, the strength of infant weakness, if eternal is so young. See the God blasphemed and doubted in the schools of Greece and Rome. See the powers of darkness routed, taken at their utmost gloom. Nature's decorations glisten, far above their usual trim. Birds on box and laurels listen, as so near the cherubs hymn. Boreas now no longer winters on the desolated coast. Oaks no more are riven in splinters by the whirlwind and his host. Sphinx and oozles sing sublimely. We too have a saviour born. Whiter blossoms burst untimely on the blessed mosaic thorn. God, all bounteous, all creative, whom no ills from good dissuade, is incarnate and a native of the very world he made. Christmas is come, and every heart makes room to give him welcome now. E'en once will dry its tears in mirth, and crown him with a holly bough. So tramping neath a winter's sky, or snow-track paths and rimy stiles, the housewife sets her spinning by, and bids him welcome with a smile. Neighbours resume their annual cheer, Wishing we smiles and spirits high, glad Christmas and a happy year to every morning passerby. Milkmaids their Christmas journeys go, accompanied with favoured swain, and children pace the crumping snow to taste their granny's cake again. Hung with the ivy's veining bough, the ash tree round the cottage farm are often stripped of branches now, the cotter's Christmas hearth to warm. He swings and twists his hazel band and lops them off 
we sharpen hooks, and oft brings ivy in his hand to decorate the chimney nook. Old winter wipes his icicles by and warms his fingers till he smiles where cottage hearths are blazing high and labor resteth from its toils. We merry mirth beguiling care, old customs keeping with a day, friends meet their Christmas cheer to share and pass it in a harmless way. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, uh, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last, the dishes were set on, and great was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all round the bowl. And even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, its size and cheekness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, 
as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchit in particular was steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plate being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Uh, suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose. A supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half a half a quartern of ignited brandy and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding. Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have snatched the hint of such a thing. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dear. God bless us. Which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. Now we come back to our own century with W.H. Auden again. His lullaby for Mary speaks of the anxiety and sense of danger aroused by the birth of her son. What will his future be? Can she protect him? Auden's final prayer is, nevertheless, to follow this child through life and find astonishing fulfilment. At the manger. Oh, shut your bright eyes that mine must endanger with their watchfulness. Protected by its shade, escape from my care. 
What can you discover from my tender look but how to be afraid? Love can but confirm the more it would deny. Close your bright eye. Sleep. What have you learned from the womb that bore you but an anxiety your father cannot feel? Sleep. What will the flesh that I gave do for you or my mother love but tempt you from his will? Why was I chosen to teach his son to weep? Little one, sleep. Dream. In human dreams, earth ascends to heaven where no one need pray nor ever feel alone. In your first few hours of life here, oh, have you chosen already what death must be your own? How soon will you start on the sorrowful way? Dream while you may. He is the way. Follow him through the land of unlikeness 
you will see rare beasts and have unique adventures. He is the truth. Seek him in the kingdom of anxiety. You will come to a great city that has expected your return for years. He is the light. Love him in the world of the flesh, and at your marriage, all its occasions shall dance for joy.
Christmas at King's is brought to you by Honeywell with best wishes for a happy holiday season and a world of peace in the new year.